Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Diplomacy course. We will continue with Chapter 3, Historical Evolution of Diplomacy. In this chapter, we will firstly talk about diplomacy in the Old World, from ancient times to Renaissance, then Italian city-states and Renaissance diplomacy, Old diplomacy, transition to permanent diplomacy, and finally, new diplomacy. Let's start with diplomacy in the Old World. From ancient times to Renaissance, the term Old World here refers to a period of time starting from ancient world to the emergence of Renaissance, especially in Italian peninsula. The political authorities of the Old World were far from being as organized as modern state structures. The main difference between ancient states and modern state structures was lying in the capacity of centralization. What we call ancient diplomacy today took place both within and among these states of the Old World. The diplomatic practices within an ancient state took place among the local authorities, such as feudal lords, chieftains, and tribal leaders. These practices vary from mutual visits to trade and security-related agreements between them. Ancient Greek civilization can be considered as the first political context that left certain reliable and copious evidence for a diplomatic system that emerged among equal counterparts and inherited by the later European political units as the custom of diplomacy. The medieval world also prepared the political context for transition to permanent diplomacy. Drastic fragmentation of Europe, especially after the fall of Rome, accelerated conflicts as quite well as diplomatic interactions among the political entities in Europe. Let's talk about Italian city-states and Renaissance diplomacy. Italian peninsula was home to certain developments that impacted the whole European political context, especially in the 15th and 16th centuries. Beginning in Florence in the 14th century, the period called Renaissance contributed to the developments not only in art, philosophy, and science, but also in the conduct of diplomacy. It can be asked why in the Renaissance Italy, but not somewhere else, did the early institutions of modern democracy emerge. Three important factors can be noted. Firstly, the political equation among small Italian city-states facilitated the consolidation of diplomacy as a preferred tool for solution of the problems in the peninsula. Secondly, the common language that is shared by all these small city-states served as another facilitator for diplomatic progress in the region. Despite the lack of a political unity among the city-states, there was a linguistic unity among them. Italian, being the lingua franca in the peninsula, was accepted as the common language for any form of correspondence among the city-states. This became an asset for the facilitation of dialogue and prepared the ground for diplomatic interactions to become an effective tool in the interstate affairs. Now we will look into what we call the old diplomacy. Many diplomatic practices that interactions among Italian city-states revealed were also copied later in other regions of Europe. The emergence of modern centralized states has been the most significant factor that triggered a need for transition to more continuous, organized, and constant conduct of diplomacy for European states. The custom that emerged in the Italian peninsula during the Renaissance were spread and later institutionalized in the rest of Europe, mainly after the Peace of Westphalia. With the Peace of Westphalia, German principalities institutionalized the notion of resident ambassador, just like Italian city-states did in 16th century. The British also copied and internalized these diplomatic customs. France can be noted as one exception to this. Although France did have envoys and resident diplomatic missions in several countries as early as the beginnings of the 16th century, it did not follow the general European fashion to build resident and constant diplomatic missions in European capitals. Yet France has come forward as the country which kept most active contact with the Muslim world. Now we can move on to the transition to permanent diplomacy. So-called old diplomacy 
presented a diplomatic practice in which permanent institutions and customs of diplomacy started to crystallize and consolidate. In this regard, the period after the Peace of Westphalia was a term that opened the door for a transition to permanent diplomacy. After the French Revolution of 1789, France turned into a constitutional monarchy in which the king was balanced and limited. Napoleon Bonaparte came forward as a charismatic figure in the French politics and became the president of the republic. Yet he abolished the republic and declared himself as the emperor. These developments in the French domestic politics disquieted the monarchs of Europe deeply as Napoleon put a solid challenge to the very idea of conservative European monarchies. Napoleon appeared as the distributor of two very dangerous ideologies throughout the Europe, republicanism and nationalism. After defeating Napoleon following long-lasting and bloody wars, European monarchs gathered in Vienna to discuss the conditions for restoration of monarchy in France and setting the new balance of power. After the Congress of Vienna, permanent diplomacy was a model followed by all European powers, including Ottoman Empire. All European states started to establish their own domestic machineries for the institutionalization and continuity of the diplomatic practices. Three main important developments can be noted for the full transition to permanent diplomacy. Professionalization and recruitment, administrative structuration, and emergence of ministries. Before we end, we should look into what new diplomacy is. What is referred to as new diplomacy in this chapter does not refer to a complete new paradigm of the conduct of diplomacy. Rather, it aims to emphasize certain new attachments to diplomatic practice, which mainly emerged with the post-Cold War term. The end of the Cold War did not only change the structure of world politics, it also opened the so-called Pandora's box of new actors, new strategies, and reconsidered conceptions of diplomacy. The Cold War context had created a political environment in which security concerns dominated every other aspect of social and political agenda. Yet the end of the Cold War gradually eased the hard security concerns of states and opened a space for new actors to get involved in diplomatic practice. Firstly, the nature of foreign policy shifted from a pure state-centric to a more multi-actor and multifactorial ground. Secondly, states also noted these changes in the nature of the diplomacy and they also developed new strategies to address the new necessities of international politics. Amongst others, public diplomacy has come forward as a new and steady institution within the permanent machineries of diplomacy. So, this is the end of our program for Chapter 3 of Diplomacy Course. Goodbye and see you in our next program, Chapter 4. Thank you.